And today we're going to be in Luke chapter 19, and I've titled my message today, Two Ways to Lose It All. You see, in these stories that we're about to, to read, that we're going to be reading, we're going to be seeing two men lose what they cherished in two completely different ways. Now here, Luke 19 introduces us to the climax of Luke's gospel. In the first section that we're going to be covering today, Jesus will show us that his mission is to seek the lost or seek and save the lost. Then in his second, in the second section, we're going to be reading a parable that he shared that reveals his need to leave for a long period of time before returning as king. So as we go through these two passages, these two things will become clear. The Lord's dedication to finding and saving the lost and God's kingdom will not come in its fullness until it's time for him, for him to return. Until then, his servants, believers, must continue to serve him faithfully and wisely. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, as we open up your word, um, we ask that you speak to us clearly and loudly and powerfully, Lord. So bless this message, Lord, that I'm about to share that you helped me to prepare. And Lord, may it go out there to whoever's listening and whoever may hear it on the other side of the world. Um, may their lives be changed as well. Thank you again for giving us a fourth year here, Lord, and, and we pray for many more. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. And the word of God says, He, being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up, hurry and come down because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed, welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay, to stay with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have exhorted anything from anyone, I will pay back four times as much. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. This meeting, this interaction with Zacchaeus illustrates the truth of what our Lord said back in the previous chap chapter in verse 27. What is impossible with man is possible with God. As our Lord entered Jericho on his journey towards Jerusalem, an interruption came before he could leave the city. Luke tells us that a chief tax collector was absolutely determined to see well he was first curious but he was absolutely determined to see Jesus and we've mentioned um, tax collectors before here uh, before here but for those who may not know as an administrator for the Roman government this chief tax collector collected the taxes he supervised other tax collectors so Zacchaeus had probably gained his wealth by overcharging the Jewish people and also taking a cut from the taxes gathered by 
the other tax collectors that he supervised. But the reality is that no matter how rich, how much money he had, how much power he had attained, it couldn't provide the one thing he wanted more than anything else. And we'll find that out in just a minute. Well, because he was a short man, he was unable to see over or, or get through the massive crowd that was swarming around Jesus. So Zacchaeus noted the direction he was, he was, uh, take, Jesus was taking. He ran ahead, found a sycamore tree, and climbed up to its branches just to take a look at Jesus as he was passing by. Now, curiosity is certainly a characteristic of most children. Wouldn't you agree? Children are pretty curious. They, they want to get into things. They want to discover new things. And, and Zacchaeus was motivated by that kind of curiosity that day. Like, he was curious. Why the big crowd? Who was Jesus of Nazareth? Who was this Jesus of Nazareth they were following? And he was wondering, what am I missing? What is it? that everybody knows about that I don't. In the previous chapter again, Jesus said this in verse 17, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Perhaps more than anything else, it's pride that keeps many successful people from trusting in Jesus Christ, from trusting in Jesus Christ. And it's pride that keeps people from having that childlike curiosity. So as Jesus is walking in the direction he was going in and he neared that sycamore tree, he looked up <laughs> and saw a man in, it, in its branches and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry up, come on down. And he invited him over. He invited himself over to Zacchaeus's house for, for a meal. Now this is the only case on record where the Savior invited himself to a home. In verse six, it says Zacchaeus did what he was told, and received the joy, the Lord joyfully. However, in the following verse, we see that Jesus's critics began to complain because. He had gone to stay with a sinful man. In their eyes, in their opinion, how could Jesus fellowship, eat in fellowship with such a traitor, with such a horrible man? He was stealing from the Jews. He was working with the Roman government. So they saw him as worse than the worst among Jews, a traitor. Well, Jesus showed that he was an equal opportunity diner with traitors. Earlier, he had eaten at, at the home of Pharisees and showed how they too were traitors to God's intentions for, for the Jews. Now he ate with a person whom the Jews considered a political and economic traitor. After meeting Jesus, though, this tax collector was never the same again. In receiving Jesus and spending just a little time with him, Zacchaeus knew that he had to repent and make restitution. And he did this by committing to do two things. First, he would give half of his possessions to the poor. And second, he would find the people that he had exhorted, extorted on their tax bill and pay back four times as much as he cheated them. Now, if you look back, if you look at passages such as Exodus 22, verse 4, uh, and verse 7, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 5, and Numbers chapter 5, verse 7, this was more than what was required. His actions, Zacchaeus' actions, was now controlled by love and no longer mastered by greed. He had a new lifestyle because he had a new Lord. 
this new life he now had gave him a desire to start paying back what he had wrongfully taken in the past. And as a display for, of his gratitude for his salvation, he now wanted to use his money for the glory of God and to bless his neighbors. So what we see here is the first way to lose it all, willingly surrendering it, willingly giving it up. Verse 8, that verse there, is one of the strongest in the Bible on restitution. However, it must be said that uh, salvation doesn't relieve a person from righting the wrongs of the past. Debts that are owed during one's unconverted days aren't canceled by being born again, by the new birth. Just because you became a Christian doesn't mean that you could stop paying your debts. Paul even mentions this in Romans chapter 13, verses 7 and 8. There he says to the believer, Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Also, and this is also an important point here, if money was stolen before salvation, then a true sense of the grace of God requires that this money be repaid after a person has become a child of God. Listen to what the Lord said in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 15. If they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. Jesus showed ultimate acceptance of the tax collector or the traitor's turn, turned repentant sinner. Salvation had come to Zacchaeus and to his house. And keep in mind that Jesus' mission had basically been a mission to the Jews. And as a son of Abraham, this man was a Jew, even though no one wanted to, to claim him. That couldn't be undone. Even if he were seen as a traitor in Jewish eyes. However, for Jesus, a repentant Jew with such a sketchy background was better than a self-righteous Jew with no sense of the need for repentance. In the final verse of this scene with Zacchaeus, Luke provides for us the, probably the most significant statement about Jesus. There in verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek, has, has come to seek and to save the lost. Here Jesus clearly understood what his purpose was here on earth. It wasn't to reform the Jewish religion or to prove the Pharisees wrong or to even bring in a military or political kingdom. It was none of those things. His purpose was to bring salvation to lost people. Jesus dedicated the three years of his earthly ministry to finding people who knew they were lost and showing them God's way of salvation, the way of repentance and faith. A, close, a closer look at this entire account with Zacchaeus gives us a remarkable who, what, where, when, and why, and how of receiving Jesus. Who Jesus wants to receive him? The lost. What Jesus wants with those who receive him? Relationship. Where Jesus wants to go? Down to him. When Jesus wants you to receive him? Immediately, quickly. Why Jesus wants you to receive him? To be with him to connect with him in life. How does, 
how does or how Jesus wants you to receive him? Joyfully. Well, we all pretty much know that when a day begins, when your day begins, you never know how it's going to end. For Zacchaeus, that day ended in joyful fellowship with the Son of God. For he was now a changed man with a new life. Jesus, right now, to this day, is still seeking the lost. And he's yearning to save them. So the question is, has he found you? Are you out there curiously wondering about Jesus, wanting to know about him? He'll, he'll stop there right below your tree where you're hiding in the branches and he'll say, come down. Will you come down? That's the question. Will you come down and meet him? In the next section that we're about to read, Jesus will share another parable related to his return. So let's read about that now by going to verse 11. Luke chapter 19, verse 11. As they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. And they thought the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Therefore, he said, a nobleman traveled to a far country to receive for him authority to be king and then to return. He called ten of his servants, gave them ten minas and told them, engage in business until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation, a delegation after him saying, we don't want this man to rule over us. At his return, having received the authority to be king, he summoned those servants he had given the money to so that he can find out how much they had made in business. The first came forward and said, Master, your mina has earned ten more minas. Well done, good servant, he told them. Because you have been faithful in a very small matter, have authority over ten towns. The second came and said, Master, your mina has made five minas. So he said to him, You will be over five towns. And another came and said, Master, here is your mina. I have kept it safe in a cloth because I was afraid of you since you're a harsh man. You collect what you don't deposit and reap what you don't sow. He told them, I will condemn you by what you have said, you evil servant. If you knew I was a harsh man collecting what I didn't deposit and reaping what I didn't sow, why then didn't you put my money in the bank? And when I returned, I would have collected it with interest. So he said to those standing there, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. But they said to him, Master, he has ten minas. I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. And from the one who does not have, even what he does have will be taken away. But bring here those, these enemies of mine who did not want me to rule over them and slaughter them in my presence. This parable taught a concluding lesson on the proper attitude towards one temporal resources in light of eternity. Having made his way up the dangerous winding mountain road from Jericho, Jesus was now near the entrance to Jerusalem. Following him were the crowds that had been listening to all that he had been teaching about. Many of them, though, were coming to the conclusion that the kingdom of God was going to appear right away. Once he entered into Jerusalem, the kingdom of God would come. Evidently, they thought he would enter Jerusalem as a conquering king, ready to throw out the Roman government and take charge. 
Maybe he'd use the miraculous powers that he had shown and call on God to send an angelic army. And a son of David would once more occupy the throne of David. Well, here, Jesus sought to dash such expectations with a typical teaching message, method that he regularly used to reveal a powerful truth. He told a parable. Now, commonly known as the parable of the ten minas, it's meant to teach that while Jesus is temporarily away, his servant slaves must serve him faithfully and wisely. Now, the way I've broken down this, this parable is, is in two parts. Part one concerned a nobleman who traveled to a far off country to receive for himself authority to be king and then to return. The citizens, however, sent a delegation after him saying, we don't want that man to be our king. We don't want that man to rule over us. Well, at the end of this parable, it's revealed that these rebellious citizens called enemies of the master, of the king, would be destroyed. This picture is, of course, that of the Lord Jesus Christ who would depart after the resurrection, after he would rise from the dead, but will return to establish his kingdom. As I look at the world around us, especially here in our country, it appears to me that we're living in the period between verses 14 and 15, when our Lord and Master when our Lord and Master will, is absent, but will, will return according to his promise. As Christians, you and I have been given a task to perform in the meantime. And we must be faithful to perform that task and to complete it until he comes. The question each and every one of you must answer is, are you doing that? Are you performing the task? Are you obediently, obediently following the calling that he's given you? Or is life so comfortable for you that his return isn't really something that you think about? One day soon, and I think it'll be soon, his kingdom will be evident to all the world and the hearts of every person will be revealed and on that day and on that day he will summon all his servants if you're a believer a born-again christian he will summon you and he will and all his servants that he entrusted responsibility to and he will he's going to want to know how or what they have done with the resources that he gave them So that's what you have to think about. What have you done? What are you doing right now with what he's given you? With what he's blessed you with? Are you taking those, have you taken those steps to fulfill that calling? Even though it may be scary, it may be scary and, and, and you don't know about the future. You like to be control of, of, of things. Have you taken those steps to be faithful to your calling? And whatever he's given you, whatever he's blessed you with, are you blessing others with it? Are you using it for his glory? Also, don't be like some who think that they have the way of God all locked up, that they have it all figured out. But in reality, they're actively opposing Jesus. Let me explain. Now, although here the Lord may have been speaking directly to the Pharisees and the scribes who would soon lead him to Pilate and to Calvary, they were opposing him. And like them, there are many today who are consciously doing the same thing, who are consciously opposing the Lord, who are saying, you know what, Lord, I don't want anything to do with, their, with you, Lord, and, and are actually speaking out against Jesus 
because his way doesn't line up with their way. They know what they must do. They know, they've heard the message. Maybe they've grown up in the church. They know what they must do to have eternal life or to get back into a right relationship with the Lord. But they don't do it. They don't want to do it. Why? Because it's an inconvenience for them. It doesn't fit into their lifestyle that they're living right now. It doesn't fit in with, with uh, the teachings that they're getting from their, from their friends or from teachers or from the world. It's just easier to follow what the, what the world is saying than what the Bible is saying. It's an inconvenience. Jesus' way is an inconvenience for them. They don't want his type of relationship to God and refuse to acknowledge him as king. So every rebel, every person that's actively opposing him needed to be warned. Eternal slaughter and death awaited them. Active opposition to God brings even greater punishment than refusal to do things God's ways. As Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Part two of this parable concerned the charge the master left with his servants. Ten of his servants were each, giving, were each given a, min, a mina. It's a unit of money worth about one-sixtieth of a talent, or about three months' wages. And they were told to engage in business with his money, in other words, to invest it. Well, upon his return, the now king summoned those servants that he had given the money to so that he can find out how much they had made in business. With two of those servants, the accounting was good. Each man had made money by his investments. One had made 10 more minas and the other five more. Each was commended in verses 17 and 19 and even given greater opportunity for service. The first was given authority over 10 towns and the second over five towns. Thus far, this parable illustrated the principles Jesus had taught in early occasions. You may have noticed, you may have probably noticed that this parable looks similar to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, but it's actually different. The parable of the ten talents in which men were given one five and ten talents speaks of a variety of gifts and ministry and ministries given to believers on the other hand this this parable the parable of the ten minas in which everyone is given the same amount speaks of equality of opportunity now what do i mean well again let me try to explain because of what they can accomplish it seems that some people are given more time each day. The fact is, however, that you're given the same 24 hours every day. Although the amount may, uh, may differ radically, we've all been given the same opportunity to invest a portion of our income in the kingdom. And even though you may be inclined to think that you can't witness because the message you've been given to share is a lot harder than the message others are given. You've been given precisely the same message. That message hasn't changed. Whenever you find yourself troubled by this, consider what Horatius Bonar said. The gospel is good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God about what he is and what he did. He is the word made flesh. It is he whom the Father sent in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. 
He was lifted up and crucified. He died. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He went up to heaven and sat down on the Father's right hand. He ever lives to make intercession for us. In these simple facts, when a child can understand it, is constrained, is contained the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Now, in verse 20, it says there was a third servant called another. In the Greek, that word heteros, it, it, the word is heteros, and it means another of a completely different sort. This slave hadn't done anything with the money. He didn't even invest in the money. His excuse was that he was afraid of the master because he was a hard man to deal with, taking what isn't his and harvesting crops that he didn't plant. And that's in the New Living Translation. But what he was basically claiming here was that his master was so powerful that he didn't need his servant's help. Well, this provoked a scathing rebuke from the master. By quoting the words of the master, Jesus wasn't admitting that they were true. He was simply exposing the sinful heart of the servant who was now blaming the master for his own laziness. But here's the thing. If he really believed what he said about the master, then at least what he at least he could have, at least what he could have done was to put his money into the bank. So that when the master returned home, when he returned back, he would have collected it, he would have withdrawn it with interest. Verse 23 seems to suggest that we should either put everything we have to the work to work for the Lord or turn it over to someone else who will use it for him. So the master, the king, issues a strong verdict. Take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. In other words, the most faithful of the slaves got even more reward and responsibility while the unwise slave was left empty-handed. In the end, because he proved himself unable to manage his master's things, he was given nothing to manage. Whatever plan he had, whatever thing he was concocting in the back of his head, it completely backfired. What he thought he controlled, he actually lost. And it's here where we find the second way to lose it all, having it all taken away from you. Now, there are several things that we can apply here. To begin with, this shows us that if we don't use our opportunities for the Lord, they will be taken from us. They will be taken from us. For example, I believe that if I hadn't received or hadn't accepted God's calling and the opportunities that he gave me or gone through the doors that he opened for me, I believe he would have used someone else to be here. Yeah, maybe the church would have been called something else or whatnot or, you know, things may have looked a little bit different, but he would have still called someone to to plant a church like this here in, in the Northeast El Paso. He would have done that if I wasn't faithful to, to him. I've known a lot of people that have the potential to do great things for the Lord, but fear or doubt or a bunch of other things has kept them back. A bunch of other excuses has kept them back. Oh, I, I gotta wait until my get my promotion, or I gotta wait until my parents get, you know, this, you know, they, they're able to move out or get their own until whatever. I mean, all kinds of things. 
And it's, it's sad, it's unfortunate, because I see what God, I can see the things that God can use them for and, and see the potential again. And yet, they don't want to take that step. I know it isn't easy. I know that it's, it's scary. And I know going to, taking that step into the unknown, it's a lot of risks. You may think there's a lot of risks, but if you remember, if you always keep in mind that it's God. God is the one who's calling you to. He's going to take care of you. He's got your back. He's got you. He knows what he's doing. You may not see it, but he does. He has that view from up top. You could only see so far ahead, but he sees it all. And all you have to do is just take that step, one step at a time. Even if you know, you're know you wearing that blindfold, just trusting in the Lord that he knows where he's taking you. Trusting him that he's got you and that he won't disappoint you. So use your mina that you've been given and use it wisely to bear fruit and to build God's kingdom. If he didn't think you could, he wouldn't have given it to you. But as we see here, if you don't, he'll take it away and give it to someone else. Now, like those in verse 25, it may seem unfair to some that the mina was given to a man who already had 10 minas. Why would the Lord do that? Why would he give away that one and give it to the one who has more? Well, here's what we need to understand about this. Seeing it this way represents the response of, legal, of a legalistic system built on an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. A system based on absolute justice. But Jesus' kingdom, kingdom represents an entirely different type of system. A system of grace to the faithful and trusting. But judgment for those who trusted, trusted themselves rather than on leaning on God's grace. Does that make sense? That, you know, we often think this, it's got to be this way because we're so programmed to, to see it that way. But Jesus' way is a completely different way. And at times it's jaw-dropping, but it's a better way. That's what we always have to remember, that Jesus' way is always a better way. James reminds us of this in James chapter 4, verse 6. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A third application is found in verse 26. If we are faithful in very little, God will see that we'll never lack the means to serve him, we'll never lack the means to serve him even more. Let me repeat that. If we're faithful in, very, in, in a very little, God will see that we'll never lack the means to serve him even more. The New Living Translation puts 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 like this. God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Paul also told this to believers in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. God will supply all your needs according to the riches, according to his riches in glory of Christ Jesus. The point is this. There is great reward for faithfulness to the Lord. Conversely, poor stewardship is punished by great loss. I want to also mention that although this third servant suffered a loss of, of reward, no other punishment is specified. What I mean is that even though it appears that everything was taken from him, he still remained his master's servant, and he still remained in his house. 
He just didn't have anything. This makes me wonder how many Christians we'll see in heaven who right now think that they have amassed or have, are going to have this massive treasure in heaven, but will find themselves with none. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Being in heaven, being with the Lord is, is in itself enough. I mean, being saved and being in God's kingdom, that, that in itself is enough. I mean, I would be happy with that, but we're promised rewards. We're told that there are rewards waiting for those who are faithful in heaven. And again, once again, let me say that there are many who right now are thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to have, I've done this and this and this and this, and, and I've gone to church every Sunday and I tithe and I've done all kinds of stuff and there's going to be all kinds of treasures for me waiting up in heaven. When in reality, you're just going to be empty-handed, not going to have anything. John MacArthur said this, in that day, the full truth about their lives, character, and deeds will be made clear to each believer. Each will discover the real verdict on his or her ministry, service, and motives. All hypocrisy and pretense will be stripped away. All temporal matters with no eternal significance will vanish like wood, hay, and stubble. And only what is to be rewarded as eternally valuable will be left. So in this parable, our Lord wanted us, his followers, to not be like this unwise slave. Instead, he wants us to serve him faithfully and wisely while we eagerly await his return. We must use the goods of this world and the opportunities he gives us to serve him and accomplish spirit, spiritual goals. Again, God has given each and one of you a task to perform, and you must be faithful to complete it until he comes. So with this in mind, what would the king say if you were standing in his presence right now? If the rapture happened and we were in his presence, or if we walked out this building and we passed away. I'd rather not think about that, but you know, um, if we were in his presence right now, what would he say? Will he reward you for being a faithful steward? Or will you find, will you, will you find yourself with hardly any eternal rewards when he distributes them out? Will he be like, man, I gave you all these things. I gave you all these opportunities, and I, and I even, even knew what your calling was. People told you, reminded you, and tell you, told you time and time again. But you just didn't do anything about it. Now again, I think he's going to receive you joyfully into his kingdom. But I know he's, you know, you're just bummed out like, man, you could have achieved so much more. I, I, I don't want the Lord to have that feeling towards me. Now, I, I know there's still, there's probably been a lot more opportunities that I've missed. Again, out of my own fear and out of my own, you know, hesitancy or whatever. But... But I know that as I continue to grow in my faith, as I continue to understand Him more, as I continue to be in more into fellowship with Him and fall in love with Him more, as I continue to trust Him more, I will see an open door, and as I've done before, and just say, Lord, okay, I've trusted you. And, in the past, and now I'm gonna. Con I know that you're gonna take care of me, so it makes it a lot easier for me to go through his open doors. And that's what I'm trying to tell you here: is that that first open door is gonna be scary, but as you continue to do it, you start really believing and knowing that God is really there with you. So, again, use those 
things that use those gifts as opportunities he gives you. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, in this regard, it is required that managers, which all of us are, be found faithful. The servants of the master each had to answer to him, but so did his enemies. Those that didn't want anything to do with him were met with certain final judgment. This dramatic and strong ending shows us, shows that responding to the reign of Jesus is a life or death decision. So as I conclude here in these two passages we read, who would you say you can relate to the most? If you said Zacchaeus, then come down from the tree and allow Jesus to come into your heart so that he can save you? Or are you like those who complained that Jesus is now friends with your enemy? Then repent. Seek forgiveness and rejoice that your enemy is now saved. If you can currently relate to the two faithful servants who were working hard to please their master, then continue to do so faithfully, wisely, and expectantly. He will soon return and reward you for all that you've done for his glory. However, if you're an enemy of the Lord, I want you, I want to invite you to come to the cross and establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't have to be his enemy. He doesn't want to be any. He wants to love you. He wants to save you. He wants to give you eternal life. Just because you consider yourself an enemy, enemy of Jesus, he'll never see you as his enemy. He will love you no matter how much you curse at him, how much you raise your middle finger at him, how much you, um, no matter what, how much you bring him down or how uh, horrible things that you'll do in his name, he will still love you. He still died for you. He still was there on the cross and was punished for your sins. But if you're like the third unwise and unfaithful servant, then there's no better time than now than to fall on your knees before him. Again, ask for forgiveness. And then getting back up and continue the work God has called you to do until he returns. Ladies and gentlemen, what you see here in these two sections were two ways that you can lose it all when Jesus Christ comes to you. You can either willingly give it, give it all up and follow him, or you can have it all taken away from you because you weren't faithful and wise with what he entrusted you with. What will it be? I hope that it's the former and not the latter. Have you trusted him? Have you given your life to him? Have you been that unfaithful servant? If so, if, if you've been an enemy or an are an enemy, you don't have to be any anymore. If that's you, you're watching, you're listening, and you want to come to the Lord. You want him to be the Lord of your life. You want to be saved. You want to be born again. You're tired of the life that you've been living it hasn't given you any satisfaction. Like Zacchaeus, he had wealth, he had it all, power, and that wasn't enough. There was still something missing. If that's you, if that's what you've been feeling in it, and you know, you've looked into all these religions, you've looked into, you've tried to 
to fill that hole in your heart with drugs, with pornography, with sex, whatever it may be. If you've been filling your heart, you know that that's not, it hasn't filled it. There's st it's still an emptiness there. Well, I'm telling you, allow Jesus to come in and fill that, fill that hole. And you, believe me, you will be satisfied. He will fill that hole and your life will have brand new meaning. You'll have new purpose. You'll be born again, meaning you'll be a child of God. And you'll be with him for all of eternity. So again, if that's anyone listening or watching and, and you are ready to receive Jesus into your heart, then allow me to lead you in a prayer to do that. So if you're somewhere safe, I want you to close your eyes and, and bow your head. Those who are here, those who are saved, you can also pray along and just pray for those who may be praying this. But pray this with all sincerity, with all your heart. Again, he sees, the Lord sees what's in there. Say it like you mean it. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, contact us, let us know. We wanna hear from you. We wanna know what led you to watch this video or, or what's been just going on in your life. Um, I wanna pray with you and maybe if you're out of town, maybe help you find a, a good Bible teaching church you can go to. If you're here in El Paso, I want to invite you to come here and, and, and join us. But don't try to go at this Christian life alone. It's not meant to be lived that way. And, you know, we need, we need to be surrounded by fellow believers. And if right now you're worried about, you know, if you still have worries about uh, uh, COVID and coronavirus, we have gloves and masks and hand sanitizer. We have you know, seats where you can sit in the corner and you don't have to sit next to anybody, but, but it's better. You can feel free to watch and listen. You can do that, but it's definitely a lot better when you're more blessed when you're surrounded with other believers. Okay. Anyways, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm, we're thankful this morning you've given us this message that you've given us your word Lord and I pray that it has really touched the hearts of those that are here those that are listening and watching that it's become clear where they are spiritually and what their need is and if that need is your son, I pray that they will go back and reflect and, and hear this message and and come to Jesus and give their lives to them, to him. And for those that are working, those that are using their gifts wisely and faithfully, I pray that you will continue to use them, continue to strengthen them, Lord. Continue to open doors for them, Lord. To be able to minister, to use their gifts in more powerful and amazing ways. Maybe outside this country or, or outside their normal spaces, Lord. Open more doors for them, Lord. And those who are enemies, I pray that they will come to you and know that they don't have to see you as an enemy. They can see you as a friend. 
as a savior. Bless everyone's upcoming week, Lord. Pray you protect them, watch, this, watch over them, their families, their jobs. We pray for our country, for healing, for unity. And that your, the message of the gospel will go out powerfully, Lord. Because that's a, really the only thing that will bring people together, regardless of what race, what gender, what social class they're from. All these identifying, self-identifying factors, Lord, all that stuff will be removed if people just focus on you, Lord. They see you as their king, as their savior, and they start seeing others through your eyes. So, we pray for more healing in this, in this country, Lord. Bless this next time of fellowship and may we just continue to adore you, to glorify, and to praise you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.